This video is brought to you by Campfire Technology. Campfire Blaze is a new online browser-based writing application that helps you compile and organize all of your writing and world building in one place. Blaze includes a suite of more general writing tools, such as entries for characters, plots, maps, and timelines, but also a number of more specific tools for things like cultures, species, religions, magic systems, and yes, an entire page just for conlangs. The built-in phonetic section lets you input your language's phonology and writing system, which the searchable dictionary allows you to transcribe your entries in. And you can add additional pages and panels to document all the other aspects of your grammar. Most of these features already come with the free version, but if you want more, you can also upgrade your interface by adding new modules through one-time purchase or through yearly or monthly subscription, meaning you only pay for the features you need. To sign up for Blaze or to learn more, check out the link in the description. One of the most interesting aspects of any language is that it's a reflection of how its speakers interpret the world around them. Every culture will have a unique way of conceptualizing everything in their environment, which will surface in various aspects of their language. One of the most overt examples of this is grammatical gender, a phenomenon wherein every noun in a given language's lexicon belongs to one of any number of different classes or categories based on some shared semantic property, which, crucially, will determine the form of other words that the nouns co-occur with. For a relatively clean and simple example, Spanish classes all of its nouns as either masculine or feminine, the former usually ending in O, and the latter most often ending in A. However, and very importantly, this alone isn't enough to qualify it as grammatical gender. Many languages have ways of marking nouns, especially human nouns, to specify them as male or female, or any other classification the language might distinguish. But the defining aspect of grammatical gender is that the gender of a given noun will affect the inflection of at least one other constituent of the same phrase. That is, there needs to be some form of agreement. In the case of Spanish, both adjectives and articles undergo a change in form to agree in gender with the noun they modify, and therefore this system definitively qualifies as full-fledged grammatical gender. Grammatical gender is a surprisingly widespread phenomenon, existing in some form in almost half of the world's languages. The term gender is also sometimes used interchangeably with the more general term class. Although class is sometimes used specifically for languages with more than three genders, or for languages that don't base gender distinctions on biological sex, but we'll get more into that later on. The evolution of a gender system may begin when a small subset of nouns, or sometimes adjectives, are used as elements to modify other nouns, and do so frequently enough for them to lose some of their core meaning and evolve into classifiers which may initially only be used with a small number of specific nouns, but may later be applied to other nouns through analogy, until eventually, all nouns are associated with them. These sorts of classifiers are most commonly derived from nouns such as body parts, kinship terms or other human nouns, and nouns that relate to quantity, shape, or distribution. Classifiers like these can be found in many language families across the world, and represent a much broader phenomenon than grammatical gender. Like gender, classifiers explicitly mark nouns as belonging to a specific semantic domain or having a certain property or quality. But unlike gender, classifier systems display no agreement, and, whereas in gender systems a noun can't change gender without changing its meaning, in classifier systems a noun may be permitted to take different classifiers in different contexts. In some languages, classifiers are optional, and are only used if doing so helps to clarify or to disambiguate meanings. But in most systems, the classifiers will be mandatory to occur in at least some syntactic environments. One quite common system is to use a classifier whenever the noun occurs with a numeral or quantifier, in which case the classifiers are sometimes referred to as measure words or counter words. One can see how this type of system might arise when we look at languages like English where measure words are used when counting mass nouns, but in some languages, all nouns are required to take these sorts of measure words. In other systems, the classifier takes the form of an affix on the verb to specify a property of one or more of the arguments. In a language like Cherokee, some verbs can't occur without taking a classifier to specify the shape or general form of the direct object. 
A relatively uncommon system is to make use of classifiers in possessive phrases. In many of the Oceanic languages, classifiers are used to describe possessed nouns and their relationship to their possessor, such as whether it involves simple ownership, eating, or drinking. One of the rarer types of system is for classifiers to occur on add positions to categorize their objects. Although none of these classifier systems qualify as grammatical gender in and of themselves, systems like these can give rise to gender if the classifiers and nouns co-occur often enough to be reanalyzed as a single lexeme, such that every noun is associated with only one particular classifier which it must occur with in all environments. In so doing, while classifier systems may make use of many dozens or sometimes even over a hundred classifiers, a lot of distinctions are likely to be lost as the system evolves into gender, and only a few of the most frequently used classifiers will be maintained to become gender marking. Also, while classifiers are sometimes very transparently related to the words they derive from, in the transition to gender marking, they're very likely to become highly reduced and phonologically dependent on the noun stem. Because of this, gender marking often melds with other nominal affixes such as plurality and case, and it's comparatively rare for gender to be expressed with a single, dedicated affix that encodes nothing else. Once again, however, for the system to qualify as true grammatical gender, there needs to be some form of agreement. For this to evolve, the classifiers need to co-occur and merge with at least one other part of speech. Perhaps the classifiers are required to co-occur with pronouns and demonstratives, which, like with nouns, they'll eventually fuse with and become inseparable from, such that when a demonstrative is used as an adjective, the phonological remnants of the old classifier will occur on both the demonstrative and the noun. This is an extremely common development, as evidenced by the fact that just about every language with any kind of gender system has separate pronouns and demonstratives for each of its genders. In time, these gendered demonstratives or pronouns may evolve into definite articles, which will therefore agree in gender with the nouns they modify, a very common form of agreement seen in many gender systems. The gendered pronouns might also fuse onto verbs along with other pronouns to become person marking, and therefore verbs will need to agree in gender with their third person arguments. If these nouns or classifier bearing verbs evolve into adjectives, then they too will carry remnants of the classifiers and exhibit agreement with the nouns they modify, another very common development. As well as where and how gender is marked, languages also vary in what types of genders they distinguish. Despite the name, grammatical gender need not have anything to do with actual gender or biological sex, although this is one of the more commonly made distinctions. Most Indo-European and Semitic languages are known for dividing nouns into masculine and feminine, and some also include a neuter gender as well. But another common system is to categorize nouns based on animacy, which may occur as a simple binary split between animate and inanimate, or it may be divided into human versus non-human genders, the former of which may be further split into masculine and feminine, and sometimes a separate gender may exist for abstract or uncountable nouns as well. Any or all of these genders can be mixed and matched or subdivided into even more specific groupings based on some quality that, for whatever reason, the speakers deem important to distinguish. Although there's a lot of scope for variation in what genders a system includes, most systems will make only a small number of distinctions, with two genders being the most common and systems with more than two being increasingly rare in proportion to the number of genders they have although the Bantu languages form a blatant, flagrant exception to this, with most having over a dozen genders. Regardless of what genders a language has, each one will have a core semantic association that all nouns will be categorized according to. However, sometimes a noun won't intuitively fit into any of the genders, and so which gender it ends up being assigned can seem somewhat arbitrary. Very often, commonly used or culturally important nouns may be placed in a different gender than one might expect, especially if the system is based on animacy. In Ojibwe, rocks, which are the prototypical example of inanimate nouns in most languages, are usually classified as animate due to their spiritual significance within the culture. On a related note, having a separate gender for gods or supernatural entities is very rare. Instead, these are usually lumped in with human nouns, while plants, although they are alive and can therefore be said to be animate in some sense, are almost always classed as inanimate. It's also very common for phonology to play a role in gender assignment. If a noun's phonological form resembles the typical marking of one of the genders, 
It may be assigned that gender by analogy, even if it doesn't fit with a gender's semantic associations, although this is unlikely to be applied universally. Once gender has evolved in a language, it will usually persist for a long time. The common ancestor of the Indo-European gender systems was already present to some extent in Proto-Indo-European, meaning gender has existed within the language family for at least 5,000 years, a situation also shared with the Semitic languages and the Bantu languages. In fact, English is one of the very few languages to have lost its gender system, of which its gendered pronouns are the only trace. This cross-linguistic prevalence and persistence implies that these gender systems must be doing something useful, or else we'd expect them to be lost much more frequently. The chief benefit that gender provides is redundancy, with the agreement spreading the broader meaning of each of the constituents across the whole phrase such that even if the listener doesn't know the meaning of a particular noun, or mishears it when the speaker says it, the gender agreement on other words in the phrase can help narrow down the possibilities. Another perk of gender is a built-in system of anaphora, or referent tracking. If a verb phrase involves two or more third-person arguments, it can sometimes be difficult to tell who's doing what to whom. This is most commonly dealt with using either a default word order, or case marking, or both. But if the language has gender, then as long as the two arguments belong to different genders, the meaning is perfectly unambiguous. Gender can also provide a derivational function as well. In many languages, applying different gender marking to a single noun stem can result in a change of meaning, which in languages with a large number of genders, like Swahili, can be an extremely useful mechanism for deriving new words. Finally, gender also allows for more flexibility in word order, since the gender agreement makes it obvious what noun a given modifier applies to, and therefore there's no need for the two to occur next to each other, and the components of the phrase can be shuffled around however the speaker likes. These various advantages that gender systems offer make them quite useful despite how arbitrary they may seem, and so grammatical gender is usually a very pervasive feature in any language in which it evolves. So in summary, if you want to create a gender system for a conlang, Decide what genders the language will include, along with each of their broader semantic associations. Derive classifiers for each gender from commonly used nouns or adjectives. Decide what patterns of agreement the gender system will exhibit, merging the classifiers with the corresponding parts of speech accordingly. And consider how the gender system affects word order, derivation, and discourse.